tales for dark nights. Knuckle Supper Written by Drew Stepik Performed here by Jason Hill Chapter 2 Delinquents While the rancid stench from our dance with the devil still encased the living room, I, on the other hand, smelled like Irish spring. After shaking off my buzz and having taken a proper shower in the master bathroom, I decided it was time to figure out what to do about the twelve-year-old whore in the community bathroom. Thankfully, Des was still in bed. Typical of him. In his defense, it was my fault that the girl wasn't dead yet. I knocked on the shitter door. Are you okay in there? No response. I unlocked the first bolt. I'm coming in. If you were thinking about ambushing me when I opened the door, I wouldn't recommend it. Clink. I heard what I imagined was the towel bar dropping to the tile. I unlocked the second dead bulk and spoke calmly as I peered into the bathroom. Smart move. The brutal girl was standing on the edge of the tub with her toes curled over the porcelain edge like a gargoyle. Her body looked shaken, but her eyes told another story. The little human seemed indebted that we had offed the pimp and spared her life. I'm coming in, and I don't think I'm going to hurt you. I opened the door to its full extent and propped both my arms up against either side of the doorframe, blocking any escape. I know you're probably a little freaked out here. It's all kind of difficult to explain. She locked onto my eyes and boldly said, Not really. Pimps owe people money. She smirked as she brushed her greasy, skunk-streaked hair out of her young face. Her blistered bottom lip quivered slightly, and her picky nostrils flared. Open, closed, open, open, closed. Her squinty, blood-cracked eyes rolled around slowly, trying to hatch her escape route. So, are you gonna fuck me, or kill me? Or fuck me, then kill me? Or kill me, then fuck me? You sure didn't seem interested when you came in here earlier to watch all that shit in the sink. She started to pull down her ripped jean shorts. Oh, Jesus, keep your pants on, I said, dropping my guard to cover my eyes. As quickly as I covered my face, I was belted in the nuts with a stainless steel shower radio. Ow! I yelled, doubling over in pain. She booked past me and headed toward the front room. In an aggravated state, I attempted to appeal to any sense that this little whore might have. You can't get out, stupid. Reflecting, that probably wasn't the smartest thing to say. She ran back over to me and unleashed a barrage of blows to my neck and back with the radio as it dialed through three or four different Latino stations. No shit, asshole. After about ten blows, I caught the radio with my right hand and nabbed her wrist with my left. I could have snapped the thing off so easily. For some dumb reason, I didn't. Relax. I slid the radio across the room on the hardwood floor and grabbed her other wrist. Oh man, did I want to break both her arms backwards and crack them off and just beat the shit out of her. She felt my power. She tried to get me to release. Don't you fucking touch me, creep! She yelled. I nudged her with my eyes. There's your pimp and then threw her down next to him. I know fucked hard, she roared. I saw him earlier when I came out here to try to steal some of your heroin and see if I could sneak out. You were passed out with your hands in your pants, queer. Do you really want to end up like that? You aren't going anywhere until we figure this all out. She shoved herself away from the corpse. What do we need to figure out? Are you going to kill me or what? She backed herself into the corner. Her head twitched and she covered her face with her hair as she tried to avoid looking at the pimp. Who are you, psychos? I cracked my neck and fully stood up. Walking cautiously like a child trying to feed a deer, I moved in a little closer. I come in peace. 
I put up my arms to show her that I wasn't planning any shenanigans. Kind of. She shoved herself farther into the corner and her hardened eyes started to swell. What the fuck are you? I hesitated, unsure how to answer that question. Then, I blurted out, I'm a gangster. You don't look like a gangster. Her eyes focused on my chest. My eyes inched down to see what she was looking at. I already knew. On my chest was my ink, a Batman symbol. In my defense, it was actually the symbol of the skater Steve Caballero's band, The Faction. The thing was that I had the band's name written on the top of the black bat in dark blue ink. In other words, you couldn't really see it. I grabbed for a t-shirt thrown on the back of a chair and casually pulled it over my head. What do you know about the gangs in Hollywood anyway? You're like, 12? She smirked. Obviously she knew I was embarrassed by the dumb tattoo. Gee, I don't know. I've been on the streets turned out for over a year now. I didn't understand how she was staying so relatively calm with the shredded corpse on the floor about six feet away from her. Or why she didn't try to kill me when she stacked the crud records. Your name's RJ, right? I heard your lovers quarrel with your friend earlier. Lovers quarrel. What does that mean? Stunned by her ease in my slaughterhouse, I finally asked. Why aren't you freaking out at all? You just killed my pimp. Now answer the question, Batman. What are you? I scratched the tattoo through my shirt... I guess you could call me a vampire. You're kind of out of shape for a vampire, she chortled. She wasn't wrong. I stood just under six feet and had fried hair that I'd call a rat's nest if it wasn't an insult to vermin everywhere. I didn't have a lot of body tone because most of my flesh seemed bloated from narcotics and alcohol. I had a big lower lip and an even bigger nose. I tried to brush the tobacco off my teeth as much as possible, but since they were contained inside a walking carcass, they never really shined like chompers on a toothpaste commercial. I had nice eyes though, so that could be considered a double helping of cherries on top of a turd. At least that's what I looked like the last time I stood face to face with my own reflection. Contrary to popular belief, we have always been able to see our reflections. No matter... I didn't like looking at myself. The only thing I ever saw was a serial killer looking back at me, laughing at me for somehow being able to live. Finally, I said, Thanks. I know I'm out of shape. Thud, thud, thud. I looked at the front door and then at the little skunk girl. Thud, thud, thud. Shit. I grabbed her by the back of her striped halter top and rushed her back to the bathroom and threw her in. I put my index finger to my mouth. Shh. I whispered. Down the hall I heard Dez fumbling his way out of bed. I snapped the outer bathroom locks in place and ran to his door to greet him as he opened it. Hey! I said with a smile. Thud. 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 Dez looked up at me and squinted. What the fuck is wrong with you? Answer the damn door, RJ. I improvised. I came by to get you first. Is someone supposed to come by here? He squinted at me a second time. No. He shoved me aside and headed toward the front door as I cut my eye on the bathroom. Aloof, I followed him down the hall. He put his face against the door. I got into a grappling position, as if I was about to enter a wrestling ring. Dez looked over at me. Hey, retard, what in the hell is wrong with you? I looked at myself in the mirror next to the door. I did look like an idiot. Um, I did some blow. How? I kicked what was left of the pimp on the floor in the ribs. I'd just mix it in with the blood from this asshole. That was a waste. He repressured his head against the door. Who is it? He asked. It's Limwood Perry, the voice on the other side returned. What do you want? A copper told me to come over. I need something taken care of. 
The illustrious Linwood Perry was the leader of a vampire gang who ran the Beverly Hills and Bel Air area. The BBPs, or the Blue-Blooded Perrys. They were a bunch of wannabe rich kids who loved coke and all dressed similarly in Fred Perry tennis sweaters, stack haircuts, and white leather tennis shoes. All of them had the last name Perry, Linwood Perry, Greg Perry, Lance Perry, etc., We thought it was pretty lame, but truth be told, they were a ruthless bunch. The name and look came from a gang of soccer hooligans in England called the Perry Boys. The originators were these poor kids from the streets that stole clothing and put out this vibe that they were these normal, preppy kids. And then they just kicked the shit out of people. Linwood surveyed the room. Huh. Looks like some partying went on here tonight. Wow. Look at that loser. He wandered over to the pimp. Damn! Oh, you knuckler sure are dirtbags. <sighs> so, what's the deal, Lynn? I asked as I yawned, dipped a cigarette in the pimp's eye socket, and lit it. For some reason, the blood from the eye mixed with the cigarette and fire was tastier than just dipping it in blood. If Perry wasn't a vampire like Des and me, I guess he might have found it intimidating. We have a snitch. Harry produced a pack of Dunhills from the pocket of his button-down that was nicely pressed under his v-neck sweater. Covering his nose with a monogrammed hanky, he bent down to the pimp, pressed the filter end of the cigarette into one of the missing tooth graters in the mouth, and then lit it with a zippo by torching the roof of the pimp's mouth. I'm not going to lie. It was pretty cool. Des wasn't so impressed. Yeah... And? Well, since the Knucklers have become the Battlesnakes whipping bitches since the, um, how do I say this? Incident. He looked at Des and then back at me. We all feel it would be better if you took care of the problem. I arched my back to tower over Linwood. Who exactly is we? With his cigarette dripping between his index finger and his middle finger like a pretentious asshole, he took a drag. Me. Copperhead. That's who we is. I popped my thumb in and out of my mouth. Copperhead. Copperhead. He has no say over what we do in our area. Des moved a little closer to me. RJ... He kinda does now. King Cobra doesn't bother with this low-level shit anymore. I flashed Dez a shit look. He was friends with Copperhead and I didn't trust any of those Rasta fucks. I looked back toward Perry. So, if that's the case, what's the story? Is this guy a Perry? Yes. Apparently, Gavin. I looked back at Dez and giggled a little made a limp-wristed gesture and mouthed the name Gavin. Des turned away from me to hide his face. He was laughing. Real funny, RJ, Linwood said, shoving me. How about I just leave now and let you deal with the snakes? I wiped my smirk clean. Okay, okay, dude, just, just relax. Anyway... This asshole has been blabbing to these two slices of bacon for a boatload of coke. It's all confiscated from high-level busts. He's giving the pigs maps of the city and where all of us run things, and also giving them locations of exact compounds. Since the guy's a pussy and he would rather have the coke and the cadavers handed to him by the cops than deal with our way of doing things. I smacked myself on the side of the head. Are you fucking kidding me? Lynn, you gotta control your boys. What's in it for the cops, anyway? Did your rat tell them that they could be turned? Perry nodded his head. I guess. That is, unless the LAPD is planning some kind of bust. I sincerely doubt that, though. My mouth dropped. When were people going to realize that isn't the way all this vampire shit worked? Okay, Lynn... What I don't get is why we have to take care of this problem. Simple. 
The snakes don't want to get everyone all freaked out over the cops knowing everything about the territories and the gangs. That being said, Gavin meets with these cops in your area so they don't get busted by us. In all honesty, your territory, your problem. I looked at Des again and shrugged my shoulders. Well, I suppose that makes sense. Killing another idiot is killing another idiot. Where and when? Is there anything we should know about this Gavin? Des giggled. I mean, is there anything special about him? Not very big. Typical BBP. He's meeting these guys in an hour behind the Samsung building on Wilshire. Do you know where that is? It's only the biggest fucking building in the area with a huge neon blue sign on top. Consider it done, I assured Linwood. But let's make things clear. You go tell Copperhead that this isn't going to be a regular thing. This is your mess, Lin. I swept my hand down the shoulder of his white cable knit sweater. I've always been curious. Where do you guys buy all these expensive threads anyway? Linwood plucked my hand off his arm and dropped it back to my side, as if he was discarding a plastic bag full of dog shit. Posers on Melrose, idiot. He shoved me on the chest. You should shop there. Who farted? He said, reading my bleached t-shirt out loud. Classy. You should really learn how to do your laundry. Rather than furthering our runway model fashion fight, I tapped Des on the back. Des, see him out of here and around the block. And then I flicked Linwood on the chin. You are just so lucky that a random knuckler didn't pop you for being over here. As soon as I shuffled them out, I headed back to the bathroom, unlocked all the deadbolts, and grabbed the whore from her new stoop atop the toilet. Shh. I reminded her. Throwing her over my shoulder, I rushed her down the hall and into my bedroom. I quickly opened my closet and threw her in there. I nabbed a pair of handcuffs that were, for some reason, hanging from a belt loop on an old pair of jeans, cuffed her hands, and then locked her around a hanger bar. Frumpily, she dropped flat-footed and broke the hanger bar in the center. My clothes dumped off the bar and all over her. Stay quiet or you're dead. I got nowhere to go, she said, falling into the mound of shit she dumped everywhere. I can't tell you to this day why I didn't throw her out the window to deal with my dogs in the backyard. Regretfully, I just didn't. This is lame. Why didn't you tell me the Battlesnakes were going to start using us for this vice principal bullshit, Des? Let's not get into this, RJ. You know why. I left it at that. I did know why we owed them. I just like to try to forget the fact that I was indebted to the most dangerous thugs in Los Angeles. They were the faux Rasta drug-running leaders of the vampy underworld. Regrettably, I had to bow down to a bunch of dingbats who couldn't have come up with a better name than the... Ugh, battle snakes. We both sat on a fire escape on the side of the building overlooking the alley where Linwood told us the snitch was going to be waiting for his pig buddies. Des and I dangled our legs over the railing, trying to be quiet. Along with super strength, vampires have an acute sense of hearing, so we didn't want to set off any alarms for this Gavin Perry to know that his jig was up. I pointed to a billboard across the street, a vampire film called The Chronicles of Nightshade, our darkness. Your boy, I said to Des. On the advertisement was Hollywood's latest vampire pinup tool, holding hands with a teenage girl. A red moon separated them. He was flexing his muscles toward the shadow of a werewolf that appeared to supernaturally cradle the girl. I prefer the books, he admitted. I cocked my head toward him. Really? You prefer the books? So you're admitting you've read them? He lashed back, becoming uppity. Hasn't everyone? 
Um, no. God, RJ, leave me alone. So I read some vampire books. I put my arm around Des. It was better to leave him alone sometimes than to constantly bag on him for his idiotic pastimes and behavior. This was not one of those times. Hello, Gavin. Would you like to take down your knickers and let me give you a cock a good flocking? He shoved me away, laughing. Get off! In all honesty, I always gave Des a lot of shit. He tried to put out this aura that he was this chosen god among living dead people. But he was just another street schmuck, trying to swindle the next sucker waiting in line to be killed. I guess if I were to call someone my little brother, it would be him. Hard to say who is older, though, I suppose. None of us really knew our ages. I did guess that I was about 30-something, and he was about 20-something, but there was never any real way to tell. We simply couldn't remember where we came from or who we were. I know that I was found in the street, eating rats by an older member of the current Knucklers named Pico. I didn't know much beyond that, though. And that's where I found Des, too. Vermin feasting on the urine-flooded streets of a dead city. Dude, quiet. Des whispered as he pointed below. Two cops pulled up about a block away and walked down the alley. One of them was carrying a duffel bag. It wasn't like a gym bag, it was one of those bags you see the SWAT team unloading after a huge bust. Bingo, I said. Using a front bar of the rusted fire escape, Des and I slowly pulled ourselves up. When he was halfway, I kicked out his left foot. In a wimpy voice, I mocked him. I prefer books. Let it go, RJ, he said as he grabbed onto the rail of the jiggling fire escape. As predicted, a tennis sweater wearing BBP sashayed from the other end of the alley toward the cops. Des and I crept down a flight of stairs in an attempt to get our super ears within reach of the conversation. Gavin went over and fist bumped the cops. Sup, Roger? Sup, Picky? Not much, Gavin. What you got for us? I nudged Des and went limp wristed like I had before, mouthing the name Gavin in a negatively fruity way. Something big is about to go down, Gavin returned. He was being honest. My ears smelled sincerity. Even a rat tells the truth sometimes. One of the cops rolled back his sleeve and cut through a vein in his wrist almost up to his elbow. Want a taste? He took out a little baggie from his pocket and handed it to Gavin. Hmm. Huh. Where did this shit come from anyway? Gavin asked as he lifted the arm up, smeared the blood around a little, and then shook some powder into the open wound. The numbing cut to the wrist, combined with the pain, made the cop shiver and shake like a wet hound. I figured the whole production was Gavin's way of convincing the nitwit detectives that they could be turned. Gavin ran his nose directly up the arm and swiftly brushed his head up at the end of the line. He stood upright for a second. The arm remained steady like a table. He closed his eyes, put his fingers up to both sides of his nose, and snorted all the blood and drugs in like a vacuum. Gavin's etiquette was sloppy at best. Then again, I never really got into snorting myself. I preferred the instantaneous rush of mainlining. He shook off the split-second satisfaction and his eyes bulged down. Oh, goddamn, boys, that isn't coke. No, it is not, one of the officers returned. Oh, me likey, boys. Perry continued as he pushed the mystery powder into his brain with his index and middle fingers. Like I was saying, some big shit is gonna happen. Like what? One of the cops asked, holding back the duffel bag. I rolled my eyes. Even a shit like Gavin could have just swiped the thing from them and torn them to pieces. Des whispered in my ear. Hey, let's go now. Get this over with. Shut the fuck up, Des. I want to hear this. Come on, dude. I held Des back by grabbing his devil lock and then cracked my fist with the back of his head and toe against the wall behind us. Stupid move. Gavin's ears picked up the sound. 
Oh shit, Des, he heard. Move! We both leapt down five flights from our perch. On the way down, I instructed, You take the fat one. But they're both fat. Well, then, wherever you land, brother. Des shot me a wink. I'll take the cops. He was hungry for swine. Like two starving Valkyries, we swam through the air toward our prey. Des landed on one of the weight-challenged cops as I subdued Gavin. I snatched his head and ripped off his sweater. You don't even deserve this, motherfucker. Your gang is lame, but you're just a rat. I quickly began pounding his head against a discarded toilet in the alley, still shit-covered by vagrants who used it as a porta potty I looked over at Des, who was having a good old time with his first pig. He ripped the asshole's hands off by snapping the bones, stretching them loose from the veins. Then, he shoved them down his pants, one in front and one in back. Always light on his feet, Des shuffled steadily and swept the leg completely off the other cop who was trying to make a break for it. The cop tripped, face first. The sound of his nose breaking sideways as the rest of his face splattered like a bum's diarrhea on a curb made my eyes light up. I went back to work on Gavin Perry, the snitch. He was, after all, another vampire. I shoved his head into the bowl of the toilet. His ears crushed through the porcelain as they were cut loose by smashed shards from the seat. Furiously, I bounced him face first into the bottom of the basin. I don't want to seem overly romantic about my kills, but he wasn't going down easily. I had to use all of my strength. We had the element of surprise, which worked for us, even when dealing with a cokehead. I looked at Dez, who broke the arms backwards on his original puppet cop. Dez discarded him by throwing him to the ground and proceeded to the second cop, who was crying, with his face still buried in gravel. He tore the law enforcement issued pants off and yelled, Damn, RJ, what cop goes commando? He picked up the first cop by his neck while he took his boot and smashed the head of the other poor fuck on the ground. This is going to be hilarious. I went back to Gavin. I lifted his head out of the empty toilet. What's the big deal about to happen? He spat in my face. Fuck you, junkie. Really? I palmed his head with my right hand and beat it against the bottom of the toilet bowl again until my hand went completely through the front of his face. I opened my clenched hand, poked his eyeballs outward, and swiped out his brain. After extracting his mind, I grabbed his neck, thrust my other arm up to the elbow through the face cave, and disconnected his skull cap. I spun around like a college hippie playing ultimate frisbee and whizzed it toward Dez. Why get rid of it? It probably wouldn't have tasted good. Vampire body parts all tasted like Mexican water. They were generally more dirt parts than liquid. Only the real desperate sickos like the taste of human transfused to vamp blood. The real psychos, that is. Whew! I sat down for a second and looked at Dez's flesh sculpture. Come on, Dez. I figured my head games would surely overshadow anything Des had to offer up artistically. Do you think I'm a pussy for reading books now? He had taken the cops and put them on top of each other with their pants down. He might have even put the top cop's dick in the other cop's ass. Body parts from his showpiece covered the scene, but Des lined them up as if he were delivering some sort of Al Capone-like message. Get your friend to pull the stolen car around. We gotta get rid of... I made the limp-wristed gesture again. Gavin's body. Des snatched the hand out of the pitcher cop's pants and threw it at me. High five! I batted the hand away and picked up the duffel bag. It was heavier than I expected. Well, open it. Des licked his lips and skipped over next to me. I'm serious. He actually skipped. That was how excited he got for a fix. Slowly... I zipped back the top of the bag. Dez's eyes ignited. Holy shit, Dez. I looked over at him. There is like 50 pounds of Charlie in here. He dug his hand down to the bottom of the bag and felt around. Then, 
He pulled out a brick and slit the top open with his bullet fingernail, scooped out a little taste tester, and dabbed it on his lip. He used his tongue to roll it around on his gums. After that, he picked out another dollop and sucked it into both of his nostrils. Immediately, his face puckered up so that his top lip touched the point of his ratty nose. Fuck. He sneezed, catching a handful of his own bloody snot. His mouth opened up as he gasped for air, and he cranked his head around in a circle. RJ, this ain't Charlie, motherfucker. This is heroin, dude. What are you talking about? Why would Gavin Perry be getting a big duffel bag full of heroin? We run that shit. I don't know. Maybe these pigs made a mistake when they stole the evidence. I guess I don't care. We just scored enough H to last us months. Des, are you nuts? King Cobra is going to want this shit hand delivered to him, like tomorrow. Fuck him, RJ. We'll tell him that the cops didn't bring shit. Tell him there was some kind of mix-up. We cleaned up their mess and we should be paid for it. I looked at the bag and licked my gums with my mouth closed. That has to be the dumbest idea I've ever heard. Just then, the Desi and stolen car pulled around so we could haul off Gavin's body and destroy the evidence of a vampire walking around and talking to cops. Des threw the duffel bag at me and tapped me on the shoulder. It's your call. Free heroin is free heroin. Cobra will never find out, dude. These are the only ones who saw us. The two pigs and the snitch. He pointed at the cops butt-fucking, then at Gavin, whose mangled face was somewhat supported by his toilet seat necklace. Des then pointed upward with his index finger. Someone up there might have seen the bag. He switched fingers and flipped off the sky. But, since there is no God, I guess he's got nothing to say. Good evening. This is Jason Hill, host of the Horror Hill podcast. You've been listening to a chapter from the award-winning novel Knuckle Supper by best-selling author Drew Stebeck. Knuckle Supper, Ultimate Gutter Fix Edition, and its critically acclaimed sequel, Knuckle Bald, are available now from Bloodbound Books. Check out the links in the video description and sticky comments below to pick up a copy today and show your support for indie horror. Also, Please consider making a donation to Children of the Night today and help end teen prostitution and human trafficking. Children of the Night is a privately funded nonprofit organization established in 1979 with the specific purpose of providing intervention in the lives of children who are sexually exploited and vulnerable to, or involved in, prostitution and pornography. Visit childrenofthenight.org for more information today. From author Drew Stepick and all of us here at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, thanks for listening and for your support. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.